Right, so this is going to be a bit clunky and a bit wooden because I haven't done this for a, a little while. Uh, I'm just going to get straight into it, basically. Um, so this conference talk is a conference talk, uh, good start, about the time that I made everyone turn off JavaScript in order to see the content of my site, which I have to stress is a static blog. Can't emphasize that part enough. Okay, so everyone gets that bit, yeah? Good. So this is what it looks like, or did look like, with JavaScript on. And this is what it looked like with JavaScript off, which is the design of my site. It doesn't have any color because I didn't really do color. So that's nothing to do with JavaScript. You don't have to do, you know, use JavaScript to uh, create colors. Uh, so once again, JavaScript on. JavaScript on, you just get this. JavaScript off, uh, you get this. That's all clear so far, right? Yeah, OK. So question number zero or one to you and me. What is, <laughs> what is JavaScript? So I go to a lot of these conferences, and usually people start talking about JavaScript, JavaScript features, things that JavaScript does, syntax, APIs, all of that stuff. But they don't say what JavaScript is and still, so until uh, quite recently, I didn't know. Uh, I did some research and I found out. The thing is, we don't actually know where JavaScript comes from, like where it emerged. But a lot of people have theorized that JavaScript first uh, took hold in, uh, in Wuhan, which is this, uh, it's the capital city of China's Hubei province. So that's the where part. And now we go to the how part. And that, how can I say this? Um, so social media platforms like Facebook, they've discovered that misinformation is profitable. So some really ridiculous and absurd ideas about how things happen, what people are doing, any kind of information tends to take hold and become popularly held beliefs. In this case, that belief is that JavaScript came about when a man fucked a bat. Um, I prefer the alternative version of events, which is it was a bat fucking a man. In terms of consent and that sort of thing, I find that less problematic. Uh, in, in reality, though, whether it's that relationship in either, either direction, if you like, um, that won't produce a, a programming language. You'll either just get uh, a man with wings and ultrasonic hearing or a toss pot with a homemade utility belt. So that's not how JavaScript came about. The truth is that JavaScript didn't emerge from the natural or, or rather unnatural relations between <laughs> men and other mammals. It was actually created in a lab by this man, COVID denier, David Icke. <laughs> you can see there. Or at least that's what I thought. Actually, I got my Ikes mixed up. Uh, it was actually created by this man, COVID denier, Brendan Ike. So one I-K-E and the other one E-I-C-H, easily done, obviously. So same phonetically. Um, if you want to learn more about Brendan Ike and his interests, then you can go to my website, Brief Stop Video, where I publish some videos about the web and web technologies. And if you go to this button here, the goat's chat button, and press that, uh, this happens. And so on. Um, but the point is that when you, uh, and naturally you're going to wonder how I created uh, that bit of functionality. And as it turns out, I did it with JavaScript. And it's, you know, I'm not, I don't hate JavaScript. So I sometimes write JavaScript. And you'll wonder how I did it. So you'll look in the source, you go into the source code, and you'll see this source code, which is what deals with it. And if you look at the uh, variables here, or consts, because it's uh, ES6. It tells a story 
about Brendan Eich, who's the inventor of JavaScript. You know, the one I was talking about a minute ago, the famous COVID denier, he's also homophobic. So there's that. He's got a lot of strings to his bow, basically. So cover that. Anyway, moving swiftly on from the Brendan Eich slamming there, let's talk about the symptoms that you get if you've been exposed to JavaScript. First of all, obviously, mental confusion. Second, headaches. Um, I get migraines, and when I get migraines, I sometimes get visual distortions. They're called, if you're a migrainer, someone who gets migraines, uh, they're, uh, they're sometimes called an aura. So you might see something like this. Uh, extreme fatigue. Like, you get really, really, really sick and tired, uh, basically. And, of course, for not forgetting mental confusion. Uh, if this is confusing to you, this list, it might be that you've been exposed to JavaScript. Be, be aware that if you've only been exposed to one symptom, let's say extreme fatigue, it might not be that you've been exposed to JavaScript. It might just mean that you've actually had to endure a year and a half long genuine deadly pandemic whilst living on a small island presided over by a group of people who don't care about your health and well-being and are almost entirely owned by the Russian state. So that might actually be why you're getting that. Question number one or two, if you prefer. How did I force people to turn off JavaScript in order to view the content of my site? Well, first of all, I took all of the contents of my site and I wrapped it in a no script tag. Now, a number of people have approached me to tell me that that's not what script tags, or no script tags rather, are for. And thanks, <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I did know that, but I appreciate the unsolicited advice anyway, because everyone loves unsolicited advice. The second thing I did involved a little bit of extra code, and actually just to make this talk really, really good, um, I'm going to live code that um, in front of you now, so prepare to be impressed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's a, that was so intense, that coding session, that I've actually forgotten where I am now. Uh, where am I? Oh, yeah. So then when people find out that the way that I'm stopping people from uh, viewing my site if they're running JavaScript was actually to write some JavaScript in order to do that, they go, ha, you're a fucking hypocrite. And then they have a go at me. So if you were thinking maybe I'll approach him later to say that, don't worry, someone's already done it. Several people have, have already done that um, using a you know, digital, digitally mediated form uh, of like something like Twitter or, or what have you. Um, so that's, that's the JavaScript on my site. Uh, you'll note that actually, although it's a very small amount of JavaScript, most of it isn't even JavaScript, it's just English. Um, about 60% of that is English. So to be clear, JavaScript, programming language, written uh, by one very problematic person, English language, a natural language, created by a large number of problematic people, culminating in an empire. So that's all the JavaScript, but despite the fact that there's only a small amount of JavaScript, it would be remiss of me not to do some testing for performance. So I did that. Uh, 74 bytes is the payload. 74 bytes, that's 92 bytes gzipped. Uh, so, Obviously, you can see the problem there. Um, but it's not just about the payload, it's about the execution time. So I actually wrote some, uh, some code around the main script there just to test how long it takes to execute uh, that JavaScript, the entire JavaScript to the site. You can use performance.now or actually console.time, which I discovered recently is actually a better, uh, a more modern API for that. It's a little bit neater, better syntax. Um, Execution time, naught milliseconds, apparently. Um, I'm assuming that is actually being rounded 
down, uh, but not milliseconds. Um, if you have trouble remembering uh, how much a millisecond is, uh, it's worth noting that one millisecond is one millionth of 1,000 seconds. Easy, simple, simple thing to get your head around there. Um, now, uh, actually, when I G-zip it, it goes down in size. So what that tells you is that, uh, I'm not sure what that tells you. I think that tells you that, um, that uh, when you measure JavaScript, uh, it fundamentally changes uh, some of its characteristics. In this case, its relationship to gzip algorithm. So that just goes to show that JavaScript is a form of quantum computing. So what next? Next, um, I told everyone, didn't I? And so foolishly, <laughs> fucking idiot, I went on to social media and I said, look, I've redesigned my site. What do you think? Never, never do that. Never do that. And uh, uh, I got two categories of responses. Uh, the first category, <laughs> that's just that. Just people, OK, I get it. I see what you're doing. And the second category, what is this? What is happening? Why would you do this? Who am I? Mummy, may I please have some bitty? Demographically, the demographic split here, uh, a range of different kinds of people from different kinds of backgrounds, different genders, uh, different ages on here. All white men on this side, as it turns out, all, all men with my complexion and privilege. Um, now, so the rest of this talk is basically me just picking out things that people said about how they responded to the to the site preventing people from. Uh, but I didn't want to call people out and like publicly shame them, obviously, because that's not cool. So I've disguised them all as uh, Pokemon. Um, and if you're interested, the Pokemon pictures that I collected where um, I, I got them using the Pokey API, which I discovered, which is nice. We were talking about APIs earlier and how you can use uh, Postman. I'm not being paid to talk about Postman. I'll leave that there. Um, but you can use Postman to test that. And, uh, and actually, what I used is Fetch, which is a feature of a JavaScript language you may remember. I mentioned it earlier in the talk called JavaScript. It's created by COVID denier and homophobe Brendan Eich. So let's begin. Right, so first of all, Bulbasaur says, doesn't work, to which I reply, in what way, to which he replies, and is it he? Empty site with some strange error message. Now, first of all, it's either an empty site or it has a message on it. So, um, I don't know what he's trying to say there, but also... That last part, some strange error message, what that tells me is that he was encountered this and went, I'm not fucking reading all of that. <laughs> That's some, some sort of message. So obviously, you know, I'm not going to blame my users for that. I need to be more concise, a bit punchier in my copy. So I sort of try to, you know, I can do that. I can say J, most people know what JS means. Get into, getting into sort of pidgin English here. And uh, PS de resistance is just JS, BS. Um, Sneasel, uh, want to uh, shout out to Sneasel because Sneasel actually uh, actually really delved into the content on my site. Um, presumably subscribed to the RSS feed and everything. Uh, actually read the whole sentence. So brilliant. A lot of people took screenshots of this, my site and sent it back to me which I thought was odd, really. <laughs> I mean, they only know what the site looks at like because I sent them to it. And they're coming back and going, this is what your site looks like. <laughs> I know, I've fucking designed it. So, um, Thanks, everyone, for that, like, crowdsourced screenshotting. Uh, you don't have to do that. I could just use, you know, a, a headless browser, probably, <laughs> to uh, take screenshots of my own website. Um, Chuckle um, is kind of representative, really, of, of the most of the people's reactions, uh, which was, what, what are you doing to me? Why is this happening? Um, not really understanding what I'm referencing there or, or kind of the joke or, or kind of the statement that I'm trying to make. Basically, just no grasp of uh, human nuance or, or anything like that. Um, some people did get it, though. Some people kind of understood. 
and I've not disguised Matthias because he's, you know, um, I'm not disagreeing with what he's saying. I don't think it's foolish. He's pointed out that when he turns off JavaScript for my website, typically that turns it off for a lot of websites. And then he's discovered that these much more powerful and more um, well-funded websites uh, just go completely blank. They didn't even have a message saying, could you please turn JavaScript on? Uh, so it's sort of my site, weirdly, and I didn't anticipate this, was kind of underlying some uh, kind of <laughs> existing problems in the web, if you see what I mean. Uh, the next section, moving swiftly on, is called Reductio Ad Hitlerum, which you may be aware of. It's, uh, it's a thing that happens when you own your own website and you make an editorial decision about it, which is at your behest, you, you, you're allowed to do that, and then someone compares you to a, a dictator. And so, pseudo wudo has come in and just, they just left the one word uh, reply, which is just dictatorial. And they really, like, that really got to me. I read that and I thought, you know what? You're right, and I'm ashamed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that really was like committing genocide, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that pseudo wudo, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't really know anything about Pokemon. I don't know why I've chosen Pokemon. I'm sure that pseudo wudo was. Um, going to all of the sites which force you to run JavaScript in order to view the static fucking content that they're providing and told them that they're dictatorial. I have no doubt that they were doing that, uh, even-handed, as I'm sure this person is. Now, some of these ones, <laughs> they just made me feel a bit weird to read them, really. Uh, Iglypuff uh, it says, I love you anyway, which is a weird way to start a tweet, uh, tweet especially since I don't know who they are. And... Uh, uh, but I won't just blindly copy you, I'm not asking you to, uh, or vote for your supreme leader. I'm not running. So <laughs> lots of useless information in, in that one. Um, just uh, some tweets you get from people you think they say m they're really more about things which are going on elsewhere in your head uh, rather than what's happening. Uh, and this is the best one that I got. So somehow this, this little experiment managed to get its way onto the front page of uh, a thing of me, Hacker News. Which was uh, interesting, and uh, got this comment here from Whooper. <laughs> In my view, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be able to read this. This is the problem with this. In my view, micro-totalitarian actions like this are every bit as bad as the ills they seek to cure, insisting on infringing the liberty of others before even so much as talking to another person is the very core of what ails our society in this time. Now. One thing he has got me on is that I have never talked to a person. I've never met a person. Uh, I was born just inside the pandemic and, uh, and I've never been out. So, incidentally, then this is sort of unrelated, but don't ingest your own farts, uh, especially just before you go online uh, and start timing things. They go straight to your head, poison your brain, uh, and then you say some very silly things. Uh, I had to look up micro totalitarian. Obviously, I've never heard that word before. Turns out that it's when you seize all of the micro machines and then you dictate precisely who can play with them and which ones and when and where. So that's what micro totalitarianism is. Um, for those of you who aren't sort of like Gen X <laughs> sort of age, uh, they're like ti they're tiny cars. Um, we like things which were tiny back then. We had tiny phones, tiny cars. Um, everything's got bigger now, I guess. Um, then there was a lot more discussion, because this is Hacker News, and there were other people talking to Whooper um, about his ridiculous comments. So there's a lot of people sort of falling on the side of, yeah, I, d I don't think this is <laughs> what you think it is, uh, what's going on here. Uh, and he continues by saying, it infringes my liberty to browse with JavaScript enabled. I'm just going to read that part again, because that's probably my favorite sentence that I've ever read. It infringes my liberty to browse with JavaScript enabled. Further, when the argument is lost, ad hominem becomes the tool of the loser. Now, what I suspect had happened there is that someone on Hacker News had called Whooper a dickhead. <laughs> for reasons which should be evident. Um, but his accusation that this is an ad hominem, which is a kind of argumentational fallacy, uh, are not very well founded, and I'll explain why. So here we're going to do a quick quiz. What is ad hominem and what's not ad hominem in a, in a debate, in a discussion? Um, you're wrong because you're a dickhead. You're a dickhead because you're wrong. You're a dickhead, ha ha ha. 
and fuck off, dickhead. Only one of those is, in fact, an ad hominem. So someone just saying to him, wow, you're a dickhead, is, is, that's not a, an argument that's been lost. So just, yeah, just a, a quick little uh, uh, bit on ad hominems there. There were actually some sort of, I suppose, fallacious reasoning in some of the objections to, to me forcing people to disable JavaScript to view my site. Uh, Steelix said, I don't understand browsing without JavaScript on. Um, I mean, it's great that it works without it. Well, good then. But does it work without CSS? Yes. <laughs> but does it work without HTML? No, it wouldn't. I mean, HTML is a different technology to JavaScript. Um, how far do we go? Oh, no. Should, <laughs> should everything be just a text file which Alexa reads to us? Now, the bit that I find interesting here is that in Steelix's fantasy where we strip away technologies until we get a very bare bones form of the internet, <laughs> it's voice activated using a proprietary technology <laughs> built around AI, which is kind of odd. Um, and you'll know also <laughs> that this is one of two replies. Uh, I can't remember what the other reply is, but I imagine it went along the lines of, you know, what if you don't have a screen? You didn't think of that, did you? Or what if there's no RAM? Like, you do have a screen, but there's no RAM. Or maybe you don't have either, just to play devil's advocate. No electricity. What if I don't have that? What if I don't have any genitals? What if I don't have any self-awareness, etc.? You know, on and on, so much. Uh, the next section is called Legitimate Concerns, which is where people were concerned that I'd done the wrong thing, like I didn't know I was doing the wrong thing on purpose, <laughs> which was fun. Um, Cleffer was concerned about my career. Uh, I guess needing to disable, and genuinely concerned about my career, I guess needing to disable JavaScript makes a statement. If you want to get calls from hiring managers, I'm not sure it's a good one. Well, the joke's on Cleffer, because I don't want to get calls from hiring managers. I'm self-employed, so that's not going to help me at all. Um, yeah, so lots of people just saying, you, you really shouldn't do <laughs> I know you like you think this is a good design, <laughs> but it's not, I'm sorry to say. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, I know. Um, so there's Crobat. Um, Dust Stock's not user-friendly. No kidding. Um, how long should I expect for the, to wait for the penny to drop? I've replied, and, and he's still not getting it. Don't know, but if you're on Safari Mobile, you're out of luck. It also doesn't explain what JavaScript is. So either you or me miss the goal, idea, slash provocation. It's you. You, you. you missed it. In fact, you're being provoked now as you're writing this. Like, well, this is just shit. It's not provocative at all. Uh, and lots of people uh, misattributed, let's say, uh, accessibility shortcomings. Um, Lotad says, oh, so not mobile friendly, I see. Talk about poor accessibility. Don't know if you know this, this is a little known fact, but having the wrong phone isn't a disability. You can be disabled and have a bad phone, or you can be not disabled and have a bad phone, or a phone which doesn't have the correct uh, way of turning off JavaScript. So just a few diagrams to sort of illustrate my point. This is a large group of people, people whose phones do not provide sufficient JavaScript blocking functionality. And this is a smaller group of people included in that large group. And they're people who have to have disabilities. People who do not know what the fuck JavaScript is. That's a large group of people. And we may seem absurd to us, but that's a lot of people. And people with disabilities. There's going to be some, some people with disabilities who know what JavaScript is and others who don't. People who, upon arriving at my site, are presented with a message, please disable JavaScript to view this site. And by the way, it's a perfectly accessible page with, and it's in text. It's not an image of text with no alt text or anything like that. And of course, again, included with that in that uh, group are people with disabilities. And uh, what I wasn't getting through to people a lot of the time was that this is a blog. It's a static blog, it doesn't need JavaScript. As I explained to someone, it's a static site with no JavaScript and a 100% accessibility lighthouse score. I mean, 
Lighthouse isn't the BN be all and end all of measuring accessibility. There's all sorts of different metrics and ways of going about it. Uh, you need to do some manual testing as well as some automated testing. But the point is that it's you know it's an accessible site. It's above average certainly. Um, and as I said, you only need JavaScript to solve accessibility problems or concerns that JavaScript created. And that's true. If you have something which is running JavaScript and changes state, and Leonie was talking about uh, state and managing state in JavaScript, then you're also going to need to use JavaScript to keep track of that, to change the, like, the values of the ARIA attributes and stuff. But if you don't have any of that there, then you don't need JavaScript. Slugma. <laughs> one of my favorite Pokemon names. That is not true and a naive understanding of what is needed to deliver an accessible experience. There are fundamental limitations on what is possible with HTML and CSS alone, tabs being a common example. Only one problem with that statement, my site doesn't fucking have tabs. It doesn't have a tab interface, so I don't need it. And uh, so I replied, and I didn't usually pull rank in these situations, but I replied, I've written three books on accessibility, so yeah, I think I'd, I'd you know, have some idea of what I'm doing. Now, he wouldn't let up. He wouldn't. I kept saying, no, yeah, I get that if you're doing JavaScripty things, and then you get, yeah, the, you have to think about the accessibility there, good. That's not what I'm doing. This is just content, it's a static site. He just, so I just called him a dickhead. I called him a dickhead. I, I'm only human. I called him a dickhead. Now, just go, go call back there. You're a dickhead, ha, ha, ha. That is not an ad hominem attack. So it did, they didn't undermine my argument. I was just being rude, um, <laughs> really, uh, and losing my patience. And, you know, I'm a lesser person for it, but, I'm st but it's still not a logical fallacy. Um, to which he replied, of course, this is not okay behavior. To which I replied, my dad's uh, logged on. Uh, to which he replied, bullying me is not okay behavior either. Uh, either. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's bullying, really. So, yeah, moving on. So, Heracross and Snubble, two people who have misunderstood accessibility here. But don't accessibility tools use JS to render sites, or as Snubble's put it, hey, cool, you've made a website that prevents people from using JavaScript-based accessibility tools. Screw the disabled, right? Well, if Heracross and Snubble had invested more time into learning accessibility and understanding the different tools, technologies, software that are involved, they would learn two things. The first thing they would learn is that um, most of those things aren't written in JavaScript. Almost entirely, they're not written in JavaScript because they're desktop applications. But the ones that are, their JavaScript is sandboxed in such a way that the JavaScript of the application that you're using to read the web page isn't turned off when you turn off the JavaScript in the web page, right? See, their understanding of accessibility is limited, but what they and what's clear that they're trying to do is just simply discredit me, right? But they do have a point in a sense because accessibility, oh, who's heard of accessibility overlays? Oh, okay, I'm kind of gonna be preaching to the converted for this part of the talk then probably. Accessibility overlays, which are kind of widgets that you put inside the site, do run using JavaScript. Let me explain to you briefly how accessibility overlays don't work. Here is a website that you've designed and you've thought, oh fuck, it's not very accessible because I didn't actually invest any time in learning myself or hiring people who know what they're doing in terms of accessibility. I need a quick fix for this. Then a magical snake comes along and says, I can fix that for you, no worries, governor, 20 quid a month, say no more. And what they do is they put a kind of overlay, like a little widget thing that pops up on the web page with some sort of perfunctory choices over the display of things and stuff like that. You can change the font, for instance, between a font that is quite difficult to read to a font that is even more difficult to read because it's actually, it's this sort of faux dyslexic friendly font which doesn't actually really do anything. Uh, that kind of stuff, you know, um, change the color of the images or turn the images off or that sort of thing. Now, the claim by, generally by accessibility overlay companies is that their, wi their widget thing will make your site accessible. Now this perfunctory list of options does nothing to address the existing accessibility issues of the web page. 
it's just another thing on top. Now, you're probably thinking, well, that's shit. And it is. But then you might think, well, at least the widget itself that's injected, at least that would be accessible. <laughs> and generally, no, it's not. It's not accessible at all. So to recap, an accessibility overlay takes an inaccessible website, makes it more inaccessible, while all the time uh, claiming that it's helping accessibility. So in other words, it's snake oil. Uh, a well-known company that does this is a company called Accessib or Accessi Wasp, as I call them, um, and they know that they're shit at the actual work. They know that they're not making things accessible, so they resort to tactics like paying for praise of their products, um, deleting critical comments about their product, and trying to discredit real accessibility experts who are um, who are telling them that they're they're not doing good work and they're actually making the web less accessible. Um, I actually witnessed someone from Accessibi um, try to discredit um, a former colleague of mine who is definitely a very, very um, informed person when it comes to accessibility. And they said, don't listen to him when he criticizes Accessibi. He's not credible. He doesn't have a disability. So <laughs> it's that kind of thing. And uh, there's a great article there from uh, a friend of mine um, called Accessibi will get you sued, which goes into great detail over their, their um, practices. The next section is called milk babies. Has anyone heard of the term milk baby? No one. That's, <laughs> that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll try and explain what that means. Um, so, Typhlosion. I mean, does it have a mobile version? We're going back to my website, by the way, which is obviously telling people to turn off JavaScript. Does it have a mobile version? Me? Yes, it's at the same URL. Responsive design, isn't it? Uh, it's at the same URL, but you have to access it with a mobile phone. Typhlosion, how do you disable JavaScript on a mobile phone? Turns out that's actually quite hard. So you could say that my little experiment actually unearthed some serious platform problems, which is sort of doing the web a favor in a way, in a small way. Anyway, how do you turn off JavaScript on a mobile phone? Me, this is Twitter. You need to type that phrase into google.com. Typhlosion, this seems inaccessible as fuck. Me, I can't vouch for Google's search engine accessibility either. In what way is your disability preventing you from using it? Blocked, unfortunately. <laughs> that was a really interesting conversation, which I feel ended too soon. Here's another uh, diagram. <laughs> I'm an expert in React, GraphQL, Apollo, and Node. This is a sort of typical bio of the people who are complaining about my website. And on the other side, turning off JavaScript is hard, help. And in the middle, liars and milk babies. Either they're just lying, or they just want other people to do stuff for them all the time. Like, they can't, they, I can't be bothered to work this out for myself. Uh, or as I'd like to prefer <laughs> to them, men who rename their Amazon Alexa to mummy. Um, now some people, <laughs> they were so annoyed at the, at the imposition of me telling them to uh, turn off JavaScript that they insisted on, it's, it's such a depraved relationship that they have with JavaScript that they insisted on writing JavaScript in order to get round this whole thing. So they, you know, so Jeff here was writing. <laughs> I forgot the name of that Pokemon. Sorry, so he's just Jeff. Um, and he, um, he actually wrote some code in order to, to get around what I'd impose on him. And I don't know if it was Jeff or someone else, but someone, did, a few people did this, and there was long discussions on how can, you, how, how can we write JavaScript to stop this happening to us, which was just bizarre. But um, um, one one such person, they got to a point where. They'd managed to unveil my content, and they're searching around and looking at what I had on off. And they went to my sort of what my my resume page, I suppose, and discovered that I'd spoken at some conferences, one of which is called JS Heroes, uh, which is JavaScript Heroes, which is a great conference in Romania. And that kind of blew a fuse in their brain. They didn't, they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't get that part at all. Um, okay, so I'm going to end with an FAQ. The first question is, Hayden, do you hate JavaScript? 
And the answer is, no, I like writing JavaScript. I didn't like JavaScript, which is used to do things which JavaScript isn't supposed to do. You don't have to recreate HTML in JavaScript. You can do that with HTML and do JavaScript things with, with JavaScript, right? So no. Um, Hayden, do you hate the disa uh, do you hate disabled people? Yes, uh, I hate disabled people. I hate all people, but I don't hate them because they're disabled, and that's the point. So no. Uh, Hayden, do you think your site is user friendly? No, it was deliberately not user friendly in order to create an analog of the same experience you get when you are forced to turn JavaScript on to view a static site. That was the point which everyone didn't get. Well, I say everyone didn't get, all the men didn't get, but whatever. Uh, so no. Um, Hayden, what is a Pokemon? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, a Pokemon is an analog Digimon. It's as simple as that, really. Uh, is HTML, I should have explained that at the beginning, probably. Is HTML a programming language? Yes, it is a programming language. Um, and if you don't believe it is, then the implication is that HTML is for human rather than uh, computer um, absorption. <laughs> so it, it's actually for you to read rather than the computer. And if you do believe that, then I think your penance should be that you're only allowed to read the source of websites and not actually the rendered pages which have been created via programming. But it's just a markup language, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, I guess this is just a lobster, not a crustacean. And finally, do you have to be clever to be a web developer? And the answer is obviously not, or at least not if you're a man. So, well done. Uh, that's good. <laughs> That's it. That's actually it. I'm actually done now. Oh, there, there, there you go. That final slide. Thank you very much.